There's more people here than I thought there would be. Any questions? Um, so the question is, do any languages have basically a lazy evaluation of arithmetic like you do for Booleans? Um, not that I'm aware of. So last time, I started talking about spark and clusters, and we ended up talking about um, S3, basically the file system that Amazon uses. And since it's a distributed file system, the problem is um, how do you do that? How do you manage this, you know, distributing things on uh, multiple machines? And usually you can either um, favor um, consistency over um, availability. Um, if you want to be consistent, then you basically lock things down until they spread, and then you can unlock them. Or you can favor um, access over um, consistency. And Amazon's S3 actually favors access over consistency, which means um, if you've got a bunch of machines writing to a file and other machines trying to read from the same file, uh, they, they will not be in sync. Uh, for most of what we do, that's not going to be a problem. I mean, it's not like we're going to have you know, some machines streaming data in, into a file and at the same time other machines reading them. It's, usually it's just you have a data file, and so you upload it to you know Amazon, and then you start running a program and you write output files, and then when you're done you read the output files. But you should realize that that is an issue with um, that sort of file system. And today I just want to talk about you know basically um, how do you run uh, Pi Spark on AWS. Um, you know, basically, you want to make sure your code runs locally first. Um, debugging is not the easiest thing on a cluster, um, so it's better to you know make sure the program runs locally. Um, and then you can upload to your data files and your program to AWS and run it there. Um, and you need to have buckets, you know, for your program file. You've got input files. Um, it can be the same bucket, multiple buckets. You know, it's up to how you want to structure it. And then you can upload your programs and data to S3. And then you can log on and do EMR and actually run your program. You know, so far, you know, when you run Spark locally in a, in a notebook, it's just, you know, you don't see any of the background, right? Um, so usually, right, the architecture of Spark is, you've got a driver program, um, if that's your main program, that's a creature of Spark context. Um, it has to interact with the cluster manager. We have to talk to different different machines. So we need 
you want to allocate so many machines for your cluster. Um, that's what the manager does. Um, and then each worker node, um, you have an executor. Um, you know, when you're doing your Python code to manipulate your data, you're not you're not talking about, oh, send this over that machine, this that machine. You're just saying, you know, do this on my data, do an aggregation on my data, right? But that stuff has to be sent to those, those workers, right? And so your Spark contacts, you know, talks the executor, um, and everything you do is broken into small tasks and the order the right way. Um, and so all this is going on in the background um, when you just write your little Python code and you have a data frame, you start doing, you know, various transformations and actions on it. You have to have that communication going back and forth. Um, and that's what Spark does for you is right, it handles all that. Um, some terms you come across, you know, an application is just um, a program built on Spark and it, you know, again, we just write the Python code, but there's also, you know, your Spark context and your executors that are involved. Um, you know, the driver program is that main, you know, the code you write, they actually, you know, I want you to do this, this, and this. Um, you know, cluster manager is, is responsible for, you know, you know, give me my five machines or 10 machines from the cluster. Um, and Spark uses different, is able to use different ty different cluster ma managers, uh, depending upon how the cluster is set up. Um, when you run the program, um, there's a deploy mode you can specify, and the two options are cluster and client. Um, when you specify cluster, your Main programs actually run on one of the worker nodes. Um, when you specify client, it's not run on the worker node; it's run on the, on the master. And one one difference that makes is when you run on the cluster, you don't have access to the standard output. So if you're doing print statements, log statements, you won't see those. Uh, when you run on the client, you can see them, and we'll see an example of that. And the an executor, right, it, you know, it basically manages the task being run on that, that node. Um, and like I, I said, much earlier in the semester, um, Spark tries to keep all its data in memory as much as possible um, because memory access is faster than storing the disk and reading it when you need it. Um, and the task is just a small piece of work that needs to be done. Uh, Spark breaks what you're doing into smaller tasks and orders them. Um, and the job is, right, what you need, what you want done. And it says spawn in response to a Spark action. Remember, transactions are done lazily. They're not done until you actually perform it. In action, and then all those transformations are done. Yeah, and there's the job is broken into smaller tasks, they call them stages. And when you look at the output, when you run it, you'll see, you know, task, task, the stage is launched. Um, Um, I'm not sure one is a smaller unit. I think the task is a smaller unit, but so here is you know a sample program, and 
its main feature is it has no dependencies on any files. So you don't have to worry about not configure files. Um, but it does just print out, right? And it's a standard you know, way of computing pi by using random numbers. Um, and also I hard card the number of partitions. Um, the standard example has that as a command line argument. And okay, now I just have absolutely zero dependencies on command line or any file, so there's fewer ways of making mistakes. Um, Upload it to my S3 bucket. I put it in one I used for the flight example, um, pi pi. Um, and then I log on to my console for AWS EMR. Um, and then there is this great cluster button, right? And when I do that, um, you have an option of doing the quick setup or the advanced setup. Um, for the quick setup, um, basically my cluster, you give it a name, um, specify one of several configurations you want. We want Spark. Um, we can select what size of machine we want and how many machines we want. Um, and then um, the EC2 pair, basically that's a um, public-private key encryption that you can use. So um, it allows you to SSH into the master machine so you can Talk to it, you can log on and interact with it directly if you want. The Amazon also has what call a command line tool you can download, and then you can um, actually execute things on your cluster from that. So you basically, once you set up a configuration, you can say, just run this configuration um, without having to log on and go through the web pages. And then there is the great cluster button, which does the obvious. Um, the advanced one, um, right? When you click on advanced options, um, it gets slightly more involved. Um, it gives you more options on which which software you want on your machines. Um, And you know, we'll, we'll go to this much later. Um, making having configurations. Um, what what sort of thing we want to run? And we want to run a Spark application. Um, and then what do you do when the last step of that application is done? Do you want to just keep the cluster running, or do you want the cluster shut down? Um, And then it start, you know, then it gives you hardware configurations. Um, you want all the same level of machines or not? Um, shows you the various subnets you can connect to. And then it gives you the option of do you want to use a spot price, a spot machine, or on demand? And the difference is, on demand is give it to me now, and spot says, well, give it to me when you got spare machines. Um, so the pricing on the spot is like much, much lower than on you know, on demand, right? But you're just filling up empty cycles. And then the cluster name, um, you know, which SV folder you want to use um, for logging, it fills it in for you. Um, do you want logging or not? Um, fill the debug. Termination protection. So if you accidentally click the terminate button, they'll say, wait a minute, um, you really want to do this or not? Um, uh, 
you know, then ask you if you want to use an EC2 pair. Again, if you say no, then you can't log on to SSH, you can't control remotely. Um, and if you don't select it, it'll, you know, it gives you a link to show you how to actually use your process to get the, get the key value pairs. And then you said download your machine and put it in the right place. Um, so either way, you, either way you, you create your cluster, you end up at this page. Um, you know, it's, and it can take minutes um, for you to get your cluster. But at this point, you know, we got the machines, but they're not doing anything. Um, you get various information. Um, if you want the machine to do something, we have to add steps. Um, so once you click on that tab, you give it add steps option. Um, You know, what type of application, you give it a name, um, the deploy mode, do you want the client or do you want the cluster mode? Um, if we were doing Scala or Java, we would put a link to the jar file here. Um, since we're just doing Python, it's just, you know, where is the Python program you want to run on their file system? I don't need any arguments, um, so then I can just click add. And then you, you go get a cup of coffee. And you know, wait until um, eventually it goes from pending to completed. Um, So even though you had to wait a fair amount of time for it to run, it claims it only took 36 seconds to run, which is true, but you just set it up, right? Um, and since that application just used printout, we need to look at the standard output to see the answer, which means we need to click on the view logs, which then becomes, right? And then there's the standard out link. And then when you click on that, you get another web page with just the output from your program. And there it was, right? And what happens when you make one do one of these steps wrong? You will get it won't run, right? And then you have to figure out which step you where you went wrong. Um, you can clone these steps to repeat them and edit them, um, which makes it nice. Particularly once you get them going, you can then clone a cluster and just rerun the same operation again. Um, second example. Um, We've seen this before. Um, again, I'm taking this flight data set and just, I need to read it. Um, and then I'm basically doing, just doing something and then writing the output. And so I'm just aggregating by destination country name and computing how many countries have that, right? Uh, and then I write the output, um, and I'm getting the input file and output files from the command line argument. So we can see how we can actually pass command line arguments to our code. 
And again, right, um, there is the source file I want to run in Python. It's in my RW696 flight bucket. And so when I add a step, and I can add as many steps as I want to a cluster, so I didn't create another cluster, I just used the same cluster as before. Um, you know, again, so the application location is, you know, wherever that program is you want to run. And then here is my arguments, right? And I need to, you know, I the one function is looking for a dash O and a dash I, right? And then it's location, which is S3 colon slash slash, then the bucket name, the file name. And then it, you, again, you, it, you wait for a while and it runs and then you can go to the output and there was, you know, the rest of the files are created by doing that right. Well, you're the one that suggested the reason was is because there were one file per per group. Same number of files as I got when I did it locally. Right, so that's running right a PySpark program on an AWS cluster. And yeah, it can take it can take a while for those There's one other warning I didn't put up here, which I should have. Um, you start your cluster and you don't terminate it, it doesn't go away. And it, they don't charge much per hour, but you know, if you spin up even just three machines, well, each machine, you're getting charged for, right? And the charges, um, it's not like you get a large machine and it charges you one hour. It's like, no, that's a big machine, so we're gonna charge you for three hours for, per hour for that machine, so. You walk away and remember next morning, well, you just, went through um like i said you can ssh into your your your, your master and you get a, a linux login right so you can start doing normal linux things on the cluster um And right there it is, right? Um, if you don't have the link, right? Click on that and it'll tell you how, to, how you can create it. Once you've created it um, in your account and download the parts you need on your machine, you know, when you click on this pop-up menu, it'll, it'll show you um, your pair, or pairs. You know, you've got them. When your cluster is running, it, it gives you, on the summary, it gives you the a, um, address to SSH into. And there's, you know, various command line tools. Uh, Amazon has their CLI that you can download and use.
And again, in your cluster, there's a handy little button that says, you know, generate, right, the CLI command. And you, it, once you see it, you realize you don't want to generate that manually. There's a lot of um, flags that you have to know about. I'm sure you'll have lots of fun the first time you try and use it. When you do, you'll come across a lot of um, terms, um, you know, various options of software you can use. Uh, the Hadoop has what they call the Hadoop ecosystem, has a lot of um, different projects associated with it to do various things. Um, You know, so Hadoop itself is very low level. You have to create those subclasses of Java classes and implement a map function and a reduce function. And you can do it over and over again to do what you want. Um, so they, the PIG project was developing high level language, which you can use to then would generate Hadoop programs for you. So you don't have to do that low level work. Um, so here is, you know, word count program, count the number of words in a particular site. It's definitely much higher level than doing it in Hadoop. Um, A lot of people, when they deal with data, they do SQL, right? And so um, Apache Hive, the project to basically take SQL statements and then convert them into Hadoop programs um, and run them for you. And so here is the standard word count program for in Hive. And it, you know, it sure looks like SQL, right? But no, uh, but there's, you know. So another language you have to learn to understand how to use high, but. Um, You know, then we need access to data. Um, so Google sort of started this whole thing when they, years ago, they came out with their MapReduce paper, to talk about how they were doing things early on. And later they moved to what they call Big Table. Um, and so, okay, and then all the open source people said, okay, great, we'll create another project. Um, so HBase is, Implementation of the big table um, for the Hadoop ecosystem. Right. So it's a non relational distributed database. Um, how do you get the data from over there to over here? Right. So this is you know, another project to just do that. Right. And so the Phoenix project is an SQL database built on top of HBase, right? Um, so you can store your your data on tables um, the way you have for decades. Um, right, so 
Spark in this whole environment. I mean, Hadoop wants to write things, keep things on files, and so that's slow. Um, so Spark has really taken over in terms of if you had a choice between using Spark or Hadoop, you want to use Spark. I mean, it's faster, it's more features, it's easier to use. Um, And then, of course, people want to do machine learning, and so they're probably do machine learning. Of course, Spark also has machine learning. Um, but now we can do machine learning using Hadoop. Um, um, you know, so what we've done so far in this class, it's all static, right? Here's your data, here's your data set. Put in a data frame, you play, you play, do something with it, right? You know what happens? You know if you're Walmart and you've got all your stores reporting inventory changes. I mean, every time you you sell something, right? That goes into the inventory system, and that then you get sent to some central sort of machine. You want to you got this continuous stream of data coming in, and you want to process it, right? Um, in real time, so you know what's going on, as opposed to just putting a database and then running a batch job at night. The problem is when you're global, there is no night, right? There's you're always, um, and so you want you want you want to process a stream of data. Um, Hadoop doesn't do streaming. Um, Spark does, but Spark streaming system has a delay in it. It's not as fast as people want, um, and so there's several projects just to. Um, be more, slightly more efficient streaming systems into um, Hadoop or Spark. All right, so this huge environment. So once you get involved in Hadoop or Spark, you're going to see all these and all kinds of other projects. But there's a lot of them out there. Um, they do various aspects, um, and so it's, a number of them are just how do we reproduce SQL, right? Um, So last time, or I think it was last time and time before, I was trying to point out when we deal with uh, Spark applications, you have to be conscious of the fact that some code is run on the master and some are done on the worker nodes, right? Um, and so I have that counter program, which is like, okay, the, lo the global variable, um, it existed on the local machines, but they're different, right? There's no communication back to the master. Um, so what Spark does, they have two special variables to take to, that we can use in that case. Um, one's they call the broadcast, and the other one's accumulator. And they're one-way operations, one-way variables, right? So the broadcast, right? The driver program sets a value, and then that can be sent to all of the um, workers. So it's one way. It's not like, oh, the workers can now send it back. Um, and the accumulator goes the other way, but it's limited. I mean, but as the name indicates, right, you're just accumulating an answer, right? And there's only two things you could do to the accumulator. One is you can add something to it, and the other one is you can get the value. And workers can do the add, but they can't get the value. And then the master can get the value, and they cannot change it. They can give it an initial value, but after that, um, So here's an example of a broadcast, um, create a variable, and I need to go with the Spark context, and it's called broadcast that variable. Um, and then, uh, you know, here what I'm doing is, you know, just creating a data frame, or actually an RDD, and then I'm applying a map to it, and this map, of course, is gonna be done on the workers, right? 
Um, but now I can then access that core size broadcast value on the workers. And again, the, you have to pay attention to what's going on, right? Um, it, it just looks like I've got a local variable, I'm using a local variable, right? But that's not what's happening here, right? This map function is being run on a different machine than the machine that actually um, calls broadcast and get my, you know, the broadcast variable. Right, so here's where right the executor comes into play where we're sending things information and the executor is passing it down, right? Um because we're, we're getting a job to evaluate the map, right? Um and that this is an evaluated environment which knows that variable that has to be sent to the remote machine. But when you just look at it, it's like, well, this is a normal program, right? It's a global variable or a local variable to this program, and what's the problem? But it's because, right, the map is not being done on the same machine as the rest of the code. No, this broadcast, right, is being done on the master has been sent to all the workers. Oh, this one? Um, so what I'm doing here is it's just a cheap way of taking a list and turning it into an RDD, which will be shared among all the workers. And so this the data is actually not a data frame, but it's a RDD. Right, so it's just the broadcast allows the, the master to create a global variable that all the workers know about. Well, I should, no, I should. It allows the master to create a global constant that has a name that all the local all the workers can know about. Right. Yep. Yes. Well, yeah, but it, yeah, there's two partitions, right? Yeah. But when you look at the code, you don't see that, right? It looks like a regular, um, you know, map function, right? And Python's got map, right? So. And as a side, um, that's one of the reasons why functional programming and functional programming constructs like map and reduce have become popular is because it's not possible to just say map, right? And that map involves all this machinery to have work on multiple machines. And if I were doing the standard for i equals, you know, that is, Orders make you much harder to, to parallelize, right? But you have to analyze what that code is doing to figure out how you can parallelize it. But here, you know, it's map. There's no there's no direct indexing, so you don't have to worry about people pointing to a particular location and worrying what machine it's on. It's just okay. Now I can take the data. I can how might you back? I'll split it up into machines, and I can then take that lambda and ship it to other machines. So that's broadcast. 
Um, and we can, you know, we can broadcast all kinds of data, right? So here's a map, um, create a map and reading broadcast, and I can get the value out. Um, actually, I meant to delete this. Um, Accumulator, um, again, the accumulator is just for the workers to add things to it and then the master can read it. Um, so here, again, create this procession, I need a context, I'm creating an accumulator on the, ma the master creates it and give it an initial value. In this case, it's, zero um i define my function and again i have to create a global uh, and then i can i can add i can't act as a value here because this is going to be done on the worker machine i can just call add on it in this case i'm adding one um and then again i'm just creating a simple data frame right and forcing it to use four partitions. Um, and then this for each is going to execute that count method on the worker machines, right? And then, you know, again, what Spark is doing is it's synchronizing it. So we're not going to execute that last line until that for each is done, even though it's been done on the worker machines. So the master waits until it's done. And again, in the executor, all that communication is going back and forth so that it knows when it's done. And now I can access the value and I get 16. All right. Can I do this? Can one variable do the both? No. Um, um, yes, but there's two separate things, right? Right. And when you think about it, um, having a variable which all the workers can read and write to causes lots of problems um, because now you have to you have to synchronize it, um, and so even the add right you can't modify it directly; you can only add to it. Um, and even if, if workers try and add to it at the same time, that's okay because we can just serialize it because addition is commutative, right? So we don't care. You've got five ads, we can do them any order we want, right? Um, so that takes care of all the synchronization issues, all the um, all the problems you learn about when you're dealing with threads and read and writes. Um, and then with the broadcast, this, this is basically a constant. So again, we don't have to worry about all those issues go away, right? And that's why you can do what you want. You can, you know, I can do a accumulator and get the result, and then I can broadcast it, but I can't have one variable do the same thing because now the, the problem becomes much, much harder to deal with, right? Um, I could continue my program, right? And I can I can take this counter and now to get its value out and do a broadcast down here and then do something else on another data frame. But 
Yeah, I mean, that's what happened anyway, right? Um, you know, we think of this as, it looks like a regular Python program with running sequential, right? Um, and it's, it is true that this line will not be executed until that's done. But that requires communication between the workers and the master, right? Say, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. And when everyone's done, then we can go on. And so now the value, we can get the value and I can create another accumulator, right? Or broadcast and broadcast it out to. The question is, can you have multiple Python files? Yes, of course, yeah. You, you still need a main program controlling everything, right? So you, you're still not going to you're still not going to avoid the problem, right? Because I mean, there it is, right? It's for each. That's one line, um, and I have I can put that in a function which I call, and the function can be in another file, but it's still have you called and we still have to realize that it's <sighs> if you need more than add. Um, you have to keep in mind several things, right? Broadcasts are constants, right? I can, when, the, when I get the value, I can broadcast them out. Um, and accumulators only work one way, the other way, and it's just add. Now, what add means is that you can create your own special accumulators, um, and then what add means it can mean whatever you want to, but it, you know these things. Accumulators aren't really used in part of manipulating the data, right? If you had a data frame, you're doing all computations. You can multiply and divide all you want on the rows and columns, right? But the accumulators are really just ways of oh, you know, how many times they do this sort of thing, right? So it's more like metadata about what's going on in the program as opposed to actual data manipulation. Um. You know, so Spark has all the standard data frame operations, you know, aggregate and count by and all those functions. We've also implemented uh, machine learning. Um, you know, basically, when Spark first came out, they had RDDs, and then next generation, they decided that they could use data frames, be higher level, use, use Spark SQL. Um, and so machine learning library is called MLLib. Um, and there's a version for RDDs and there's a version for data frames. And you will, most people refer to the one, usually when they say MLLib, they're talking about RDDs because it's, that's the namespace it's in. Um, 
the namespace set for data frames, it's Spark ML. And so usually it's there's ML lib, which people refer to as RDDs, and the ML, although the Spark people say no, it's all you know one, it's all ML lib. Um, but anyway, the RDDs they basically aren't doing any more development. You know, they they find bugs, they'll fix it. But other than that, it's basically history. Um, so everything, all all the stuff is basically um, in the ML namespace. And it does the you know standard stuff, you know, regression, classification, clustering. Um, there is no um, neural networks, right? Spark does not do neural networks. What? Well, yeah, there's, you know, the Berkeley did create a project to do uh, machine learning on top of Hadoop and Spark, um, but that it does not seem to be maintained. It's a couple years old with no progress. There's um, another library called um, H2O, um, which does machine learning on top of Hadoop and Spark. There's no Python um, hooks to use that library, though. You have to use either. Um, actually, no, there is a Python, but there's no, there's no R. Um, there is, um, they've got a guide for all the basic ML, um, you know, it, which isn't too bad. It's pretty terse, but it, um, tells you what each, um, class can do. Gives you an example, and if you've downloaded the Apache Spark from the Apache site, and your installation has a bunch of examples. Um, and for Python, it's examples, source, main, Python. And then for machine learning, it's an ML. And there are a lot of examples. And I tried one, didn't work. <laughs> and I haven't figured out why yet. So unless there are questions, we can adjourn early. Some of you may have something you wanted to do this, this evening. I didn't credit. Can you encode your data? Can you add labels to your data? Yeah. Right. Does it do what you want? Then you can use it. Yeah, if it's part of Anaconda, then yeah. Okay, you've probably got work to do and